Yeah, that's very, very interesting, Jay, because uh, it's something we're looking at as well. Yeah, you know what I forgot to do is some people listening may not be familiar with photobiomodulation. Just want to show a device, how we can deliver light to the brain. So this is one that we have we put it over here. And so we develop, develop, de uh, deliver one to the medial prefrontal. It's one of the beginners. And this is the uh, posterior cingulate cortex or the angular gyrus. Then we have one. Oh, I didn't. Okay. We deliver to the brain through the nose as well. Here. Um, so there's one way of do it, doing it. Uh, you know, this is not the only way. Uh, this is one way that I see is an optimum way we for general purposes and then we can actually control you know we can actually control the pulse frequency and and induce the kind of frequency that jay just alluded to uh it can be now what we you know as we look into like athletic sports performance what i noticed was there's there are some you know athletic sport performance covers so many areas and in the in training, uh, you want to say consolidate the memory of your training. What's you know what you're trying to achieve. And then you also want to retrieve what you've learned. And the, the pulse frequencies or the oscillations of brain has an effect. And what I notice in the literature is memory is encoded at very high frequencies. Is probably beyond what EEG instruments can measure. Like like in the regions of 80 hertz, could go up to 100. And retrieval goes, you know, uh, has a, you see the presence of gamma at, at a more recognized frequencies of around 40 hertz, could be 30 to 50. When you study the hippocampal, you know, oscillations that you see the presence of, of gamma when there's, there's memory activity involved. And then in sports, what a lot of athletes try to achieve is to get into this flow state, you know, where you're in the zone and everything is functioning well, and everything's kind of slowed down for you. And that's where uh, the presence of theta, you know, pretty kind of logical comes in and theta training actually can help. Uh, here is hypothetically speaking, we're gonna to try to experiment it. Theta training can actually uh, possibly help a, an athlete to get uh, more easily into a flow state. There is there is room for you know cross frequency coupling. There's there's research done in Oxford using elect electrical stimulation, and uh, they actually found that to, for stroke recovery, uh, cross frequency coupling of I think on the slow side maybe uh, 35 hertz and the fast side around 80 hertz you know coupling actually uh, seems to help with recovery. So there's the TMS world. Transcranic magnetic stimulation, cross frequency coupling is, is is often discussed. So we actually have this. We can program this right now. Just that not enough people understand it. So so what we're trying to do is okay. Let's let's do the the work ourselves and see you know uh, what the outcomes are. We are working with a, another research center which is part of universe affiliated to University of Toronto at Baycrest Hospital. We're about to start work on actually with a MRI scanner and see if we deliver different wavelengths, different frequencies, and locations, what's going to happen to the brain in fMRI uh, measures. And we're also going to do EEG studies. We're about to start an EEG study on meditators. I think that's going to be super interesting. Dr. Lim, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Hi, uh, this is Lulin here. Thank you for the invitation, Pete. We got some Patreon love to dish out. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, check it out. Applied Neuroscience is having a workshop September 10th and 11th in Florida, Madura Beach, Florida. 
Hey, two ways you can participate. You can attend the workshop or you can do it remotely through TeamViewer or click on the link here, appliedneuroscience.com slash attend ng dash workshops. Hey, check it out. Dr. Thatcher is inviting everybody that attends to his house for a cookout. Sign up now. It's going to be a blast. Woohoo! If you have any questions, email QEEG at AppliedNeuroscience.com. Join us. Hey, thanks to our silver supporters, Mary Tracy's awesome QEEG training program at EEGstrategies.com and my media's Nexus EEG amplifier. Welcome aboard, Erwin. They're at MindMedia.com. I think we're in kind of an open discussion about maybe photobiomodulation and the things that my team and I do. So perhaps I'll start with where we are with photobiomodulation. I'm not sure if everybody tuning in have heard of photobiomodulation. It's a long word. Uh, for a long time, it's been called low-level light therapy, low-level laser therapy, cold therapy, a bunch of other names. But I think we've pretty much settled on a uh, quite a concise descriptive uh, term called photobiomodulation. Uh, what this does is to direct light, right? Let's say, generally speaking, light, but to get the kind of action from your cells and to get this kind of recognized outcomes that we're, in my field, we're familiar with. We focus on red to near infrared light. So somewhere between kind of orangish red, which is you know, visible as you go to a longer part of the spectrum, it becomes less visible. And when you go past near infrared, see around 850 nanometers, depending on whether it's laser or LED, it, it starts becoming invisible. And then you go into infrared, far infrared, where you start feeling the warmth and, and, and stuff like that. All part of photobiomodulation. You can actually have very short wavelength, like blue, ultraviolet, which, you know, as you go shorter and shorter, is also invisible. But that has other properties as well. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be excluded from this world of photobiomodulation. I think uh, compared to what it was when I first got into the field, it's becoming more well-known. Maybe that's why I'm on this show, because people have heard of it. Is getting quite interesting. You know, we, there was a big splash by Tucker Carlson of Fox where he, he proposed that if you shine red light to your testicles, you become more fertile and helps <laughs> maybe to solve the problem of the drop in fertility among men and therefore save the humankind. That, there's some merit to it, only that it hasn't been uh, supported by, you know, scientific evidence, but logically speaking, that's possible. But I'm actually quite happy where things are going compared to the mid-1990s when I first started. It was, I don't know what it was called, it was just called uh, laser therapy. And it was really pretty much in the domain of the Soviet bloc at the time. And we, we're talking about, um, well, ex-Soviet bloc, they were um, dismantled already, but a lot of it were done in Russia, in maybe Estonia, and this, you know, the satellite countries looking to what, what is the possibilities are. And I think that's interesting when, at that time, when we looked at medicine, you know, and how it compares between the East and the West. So the West was pretty much into pharmacology and drugs and, you know, clinical trials and all that. But the, Alternative countries, like you want me to put it like the Russians were looking into a, a broader scope. They, they didn't have the kind of control over drugs like the Americans and the, and the Europeans do. So they relied on magnetic therapy, you know, different things. They had a lot of surgical procedures. And light therapy happened to be a modality that you didn't have to depend on the West. But I have to say that the the evidence was very scant at the time. Uh, literature were coming out of Russia. The publications by today's standards was was, uh, was pretty bad. You get quite a lot of 
anecdotal reports, people experiencing good outcomes. You get literature, although it's not up to today's standard, coming out of Russia, even from China, uh, showing how good it is. And, and particularly at the time, the focus was on what it does to the properties of blood. It seems to help to reduce incidence of heart attacks. It's people using it seems to feel better. Um, they were, you know, recovering from surgery more quickly and stuff like that. So it went on and we, I experimented. I was in the Bay, I'm in Toronto now, but I was in the Bay Area at the time, in California. We were playing with uh, actually lasers in the context of light displays. So we were you know, playing around with uh, flat panel displays, but and I experimented with what it does to your know, blood properties very, very simply. You know, extract blood sample before and after under a microscope. You can literally see the changes in the aggregation of the red blood cells. And I tried for the first time. The Russians are talking about injecting light into your circulatory system to get this effect. And it's mainly concentrated on red lasers. So I said, okay, you know, if you want to try to get light into your body, you don't have to, to be invasive like that. You can look at where the membrane is thinnest and because light, especially lasers, penetrate. And that is already a known phenomenon. So why not go for a thin membrane like the nose and have it at very low power and we got the same effect. So it went on and the Chinese did the same thing in parallel, but it was in the 2000s that solid state technology was advanced enough for commercial LEDs to be available, even for commercial lasers. So we did this consumer devices using, we started with lasers, very low level lasers, and we got the same effect. So we followed a pattern for intranasal and we just went on from that. But today, I'm actually very happy to see how it's progressed because more and more people are seeing the outcomes of the light, red and infrared light. Today, you don't have to use lasers anymore. I know there are groups out there who still believe in high-powered lasers. There are very, several reasons for it. Part of it is commercial. Lasers do work. I think... Powerful lasers do work. Lasers have some advantages over LEDs, but but for the sake of safety and control, on you know, balance, you know, if LEDs, which is like emitting diodes, can work, why do you need to take the risk? Okay, maybe you don't have such immediate outcomes, but you do have outcomes. Now, what do we do to show that it works? Experiment with lasers at a time, you know, we, we as a community, we have a, we spend a lot of time figuring out how it penetrates and what it does to the cells. Okay, that's been, been pretty much established and gave us a very good understanding of why there's so many outcomes out of, out of red and infrared, like when you, when you can get into the cells, especially cells which have been functioning below optimum stress cells. So the outcomes are, are greater, but you know, the scientists and engineers spend a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how much power do you need? How much it penetrates to the skin? You know, and makes people think that lasers is better, but uh, we don't, I have to say that today, we still don't understand completely all the mechanisms. So the way to, to test it, you know, as opposed to just merely testing on cadavers, dead tissues, and see, you know, how much it penetrates is a completely, you cannot compare dead tissues with uh, with a living organism. It is just completely different. It's a fallacy to believe that doing that will give you a reflection of what it does to a, to a life body. Now, the way to see whether the test is whether other than anecdotal and outcomes and clinical study, you can actually measure outcomes through imaging. Now, as a group, we focus on a brain. That's what we're particularly good at in the field of photobiomodulation. We actually have quite a lot of researchers. I think the number of researchers and doctors in our team is totally out of proportion compared to the other stuff. So I believe that's always a good thing. So you can measure it from the brain. You can measure it through MRI, fMRI, the magnetic resonance imaging, 
and EEG. So you do it to direct your brain and see how the EEG reads. And MRI actually is very interesting because it gets is more precise. You get this more understanding of the, you know, the the, the spatial, you know, very, very responsive to your brain responding. But uh, EEG is more immediate, it's temporal, and you can literally see the immediate response from the brain. And that is, you know, that is, I think, better than, you know, trying to explain when you don't have the tools and the state of the art to explain all the mechanism. But as a group, we are trying to try to explain it because we're doing a number of experiments to try to establish the mechanisms, what are the effects of loca location, you know, where you put on a brain. What is the effect of pulse frequency? Uh, that is very, very interesting. I think we, we're at the cutting edge of where, how we understand this. What is the effect of, you know, have two parts of your brain, in, you know, in synchrony and and what you, what happens if you pulse out of phase and, and stuff like that. Because what we like today in the state of the art of photobiomodulation is precision, in, you know, in being customizable to the needs of a particular individual. I know there's a lot of, uh, there's more and more, actually the, the claims, the, the hyperbolic claims out there has never diminished in the world of light therapy or photobiomodulation, although it's getting more scientific today. But uh, it's not a cure-all, it's, it's not a magical elixir to everything. Uh, you got to understand the limitations and what, of course, the potential is. I just I just stop here for a while and see if there's anything you want to bring up. Well, the question I have for the moms and dads, because we have moms, dads, parents, we have technicians, we have clinicians that watch this. So I I kind of start with the moms and dads work work the way up. The light therapy, what I know about it is I, I had a veterinary tech come in with a hand laser and our we had a big dog and he had some pain and they they used it on him to address pain. What what is it actually doing? Called a cold laser therapy. What what is the light actually doing just for pain? Yeah, there is a, it is a field that we you know I've been looking into. So you gotta distinguish pain in, in two categories. One is chronic and the other one is acute pain. Uh, you know, chronic and systemic, it is, the pathology is actually quite different. And in the literature, you find that for pain, you can actually block the signaling and you actually reduce uh, acute pain. There's not a lot of work, but it's enough work to tell me that if you want to treat, you know, reduce these pain signals, fairly more, fairly powerful lasers. Usually they use lasers, but you gotta be careful about the heating and stuff. But you can use uh, LEDs too. So the idea is when you deliver relatively high power laser, they're talking about like uh, one watt. To, to us, one watt is pretty pretty powerful. You know, I've seen discussion that's gotta be about 300 uh, milliwatts, which is one third of one watt roughly. And what happens is it creates some kind of a, they call it varicosity, you know, some swelling in the, in the, um, it could be the, the microtubules, you know, which is all this, it's ubiquitous, it's present in your exons and all that, and, and your nerve, your, your, your nerve channels. And it, that could be blocking the pain going up. And I, I tried, I, I actually tried on a, some people and it seems to work, okay. But what I also introduced, actually have a device that's coming up, the pulse rate. Now I, I go on the hypothesis that uh, pulse rate matters because we are doing uh, doing research with the University of Alberta. So this team is involved with, you know, they're biologists. They are also quantum biologists and physicists in there. And we were looking at the effect of the light we were using, near-infrared light, 810 nanometers. And we did see changes, you know, 
in microtubules and stuff. And we found that it does some, some really weird and interesting things never discovered before. It does some resistance as well as increasing current flow. There's a dichotomy here, but it is what it is. We saw that. And it is uh, also, you know, affecting what we call polymer polymerization, whether the, you know, the cells are starting to get together. Uh, when we introduce in pulse rate, the higher you pulse it, uh, the more inhibition, inhibition you're going to get. So they were testing this hypothesis right now, and it has implications for, for acute pain. Then on the chronic side, it's fairly well established that protobiome modulation actually helps to attenuate inflammation. So a lot of chronic pain is due to inflammation, and you know, you know, you can you can even go to um, rheumatoid pain as well, which is you know your your body, the body uh, creating inflammation, your your you know body attacking itself. So that is a uh, at a low level, I believe you can reduce inflammation, which is a cause of chronic pain. Then we can go to the brain signaling and stuff like that, but. Jay and Dr. Lim, what's going on with, with the brain? Because it's the, the light is increasing gamma and we've, you know, neurofeedback, you're doing something to yourself, but the light is doing something to you, I, I would imagine. Could you explain it? Maybe not for the moms and dads, but maybe for the technicians. What's going on with the, the brain waves when you introduce light? They actually have a small study that shows that gamma is increased with the use of the lasers. Well, with a photobiomodulation, not always laser, it could be LED. The definition of gamma ends up being variable depending upon what group you're working with. So there's some people in the EG world that talk about gamma at 40 hertz. There's some that talk about gamma 2 at 80 to 100 hertz. Uh, some talk about ripples being from 100 hertz up to 250. There's different definitions. I, I don't know that they've got all the tuning points uh, figured out yet. It's, uh, the higher frequencies have not been part of the traditional EEG. Medically, they, they clipped everything at 70 cycles a second. So all of the higher gamma 280 to 100 or ripples faster than that are, are kind of undefined. The importance is that gamma... Uh, and ripples are very high frequencies that are seen when neural networks are formed. If, um, if you create a neural network, uh, it has a resonant property of gamma. And uh, if you're enhancing gamma, you're probably enhancing network connectivity. And uh, obviously, uh, connectivity is uh, critical for brain structure and function. If you have a pathway that has been disconnected, enhancing the connectivity in that area ends up being very useful. Uh, an example of something totally unrelated that changes connectivity is the use of psychedelics in, in uh, therapy. The amount of connectivity in the brain is enhanced by the use of psilocybin and ketamine. Uh, and, and similar uh, substances, DMT, the, the, uh, the anthogens um, end up enhancing connectivity as well. So uh, anytime you're uh, increasing gamma or very fast activity, you're, you're actually enhancing uh, brain function. Uh, you have to en enhance the connectivity in a network in order to see those rhythms. Uh, there, there are a lot of folks who uh, don't uh, see these kinds of things very often. I'm going to share one image very quickly here. What we see up front is you can see the theta wave. The phase of the theta is changing the amplitude. This is cross-frequency coupling, phase amplitude coupling. And you can see the frequencies here go up to 250 hertz. And every time uh, theta is in its negative half wave, you see a big burst of of gamma probably at 40 and gamma two and probably ripples. Uh, again, the specific definitions of these centroids is probably not very well developed at this point. Uh, the, the terms that we use to describe these frequencies is, are still kind of crude. A couple of simple names when it's obviously a very complex phenomenon. So this is, uh, this is, Motor function, frontal control over affect, frontal control over attention, 
uh, the theta nesting of gamma and ripples is critical to the function frontally. But if you go further back in the head to a sensory area, it's the phase of alpha is pulsing the gamma and ripples. So the nesting of higher frequencies in lower frequencies is how the brain works. The carrier frequencies, the, the state of the theta or alpha is a state. The content is the very fast activity. If you're interested in more of this specific kind of a topic, uh, I would suggest that Dirk de Ritter's uh, talks about uh, cross-frequency coupling uh, end up being probably one of the more solid sources on that. But I wanted to just share this briefly so people could see that these very high frequencies end up being related to the lower frequencies. The modulation of the uh, lower frequencies can affect the higher frequencies. And again, if you enhance the networking in the brain, you enhance the higher frequency content, which is a resonant property of having a network bound. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, check it out. Applied Neuroscience is having a workshop September 10th and 11th in Florida, Madura Beach, Florida. Hey, two ways you can participate. You can attend the workshop or you can do it remotely through TeamViewer or click on the link here, appliedneuroscience.com slash attend-ng-workshops. Hey, check it out. Dr. Thatcher is inviting everybody that attends to his house for a cookout. Sign up now. It's going to be a blast. Woohoo! If you have any questions, email QEEG at AppliedNeuroscience.com. Join us. Um, there are some interesting things with regards to meditation. I can get into the details, but... Yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's... Well, Dr. Dr. Lim, you had that, that equipment. I don't... Do you produce your own equipment or do you, do you, do you outsource it? We own the technology Got from it. conception, invention right up to manufacturing and everything it. so it's completely and that's why we can do it fast uh, the reason i bring it up doctor is because jay's familiar i medicine just got fda blessing uh, on their uh device and that has photomodulation in it is that correct jay yeah they have photobiomodulation there's um, a number of companies that are that are coming out with uh, that approach but uh, obviously the understanding of it, how to use it, um, is just now being really well, more well developed. Uh, you you know, pairing uh, the phase of something that you're stimulating, uh, changing uh, multiple frequencies that can be applied, uh, modulating a frequency with another frequency. So uh, um, there, there's there's so many things that can be. Uh, used at this point. And uh, without the, having the device, you can't kick the tires to test what happens. So uh, luckily, uh, Dr. Lim and others have ended up using devices that we can now you know, try. And uh, fMRI is going to end up showing the bold response, which is actually probably more glial than neural in some respects. Uh, but the, uh, you, you're going to be able to see whether an area of the brain is being influenced and how. Uh, and uh, these kinds of studies are absolutely groundbreaking. And we need the data. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see the photobiomodulation field uh, expand uh, the, the depth of knowledge and the, the range of applications. It, it, it appears that the mitochondria, the ability to actually generate energy within a cell, uh, are being positively influenced by photobiomodulation. Uh, obviously, if you're a senior like me and you, you see quite a few of the seniors starting to lose their, their, their faculties, um, uh, one of the things that happens is the brain's power drops way, way down with dementia's onset. 
And that's a mitochondrial failure at a cellular level. Uh, having a tool that can modulate uh, the mitochondria ends up being a very powerful tool. If I came up with a brand new hammer today, uh, and we'd have to figure out what kind of hammer it was. Uh, what, what can we do with it? Is it a claw hammer intended to pull nails out? Is it a framing hammer intended to smash your thumb? I mean, uh, exactly what kind of hammer is it? And we have to use it, bang around with a hammer until you find out what it's really good for. We've got the tools at this point, and we're, uh, we're, we're expanding what we know about them, uh, exactly how they influence the body and brain and cells, what those uh, can be used for in a clinical world or a performance world. There's people that work with these for meditative purposes, and that's just as valid as somebody trying to stop pain. In, in fact, they're probably somewhat related. You, you, you can be related and not really know uh, the, the relationship. And uh, I, I think some of these tools end up tying together what appear to be fairly disparate uh, areas by showing common mechanisms. It, it, um, I'm very happy to see the expansion of these tools and their applications clinically, uh, again, not just for therapeutic clinical, but also for consciousness uh, enhancement um, and those sorts of things. Uh, and I, I've seen Dr. Lim's uh, uh, colleagues, uh, some of which I know very well, and, and their orientation isn't always medical and kind of pharmacological, it's more consciousness and, and uh, meditative. So I'm, I'm happy to see that range uh, being addressed with a tool. So the moms and dads that have kids with learning disabilities, how, how does this help them? How does that work? I can tell you a little bit about the work we're doing. We, have, we are involved in a number of clinical trials. The biggest one we're involved with is on Alzheimer's disease. It's been going on for a few years now. It's complicated. The pandemic has really screwed us up for two and a half years. So it's though so we're coming back on track again. In the early studies, is a small studies, you know, on a few people. One that we published in 20, I believe it's 2016 or early 2017. But we did a work in 2015. Started with one person, just intranasal. He's he was I reckon he's more on a moderate scale, but he's he's 80 over years old now. He's still doing well. I mean, he's using the full number. Then we moved on to a smaller study of, uh, I believe, eight people. And we found very clear uh, that was using, at the time, we, we, we had 10 hertz in Europe. The drug, the Aricep was trying to delay the progressive downslide by six months. There was that's what the evidence was showing. Uh, we actually saw reversal. We saw reversal on the the, the scale we used was MMSC of two and a half points. That's actually unheard of at the time. There's still quite a lot of uh, interest. But you know, I, you gotta recognize that these are very few people. Statistically speaking, you can you can throw in square, you know, can claim these coincidences or whatever it is. There's not enough power. But uh, but it was very encouraging. And then a couple of years later, published in I believe 2019, um, professor at uh, UCSF, Mina Chow, did it was I think on eight people in over 12 weeks. So you, she used fMRI to, s to look at the changes, the imaging on the brain. Uh, they actually, those that were on the active device, and that was on 40 hertz, the first time we used gamma, uh, actually improved significantly. So again, there is a small study. We need to do a bigger one, which we are involved in right now. But I say it's promising. Uh, I personally think it, it works better on mild cases. Uh, you have severe cases, like my neighbor actually is responding. Getting evidence on severe cases is really, really difficult because uh, it depends on caregivers. They're very erratic. You know, compliance is a big issue. So far, the evidence is promising. We're still continuing continuing the clinical trial. That's for cognition. Given the FDA's approval of a medication for Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. which is crazily expensive, and it's also mm -hmm. something that has some very negative side effects of bleeding in the brain, for instance, which sounds like a stroke to me. But the cost of that uh, pa pa treating one patient with that medication could fund these devices for uh, a whole community of people. So 
uh, it, it, it's kind of crazy uh, to think of a, a risky pharma solution uh, when we have photobiomodulation solution that's more cost effective. The, uh, the, uh, the clinical benefit for the pharma is probably at, at a, a questionable level in the first place. I mean, it, uh, they, their study came out positive, so they convinced the FDA uh, to cover their uh, medication. But again, uh, insurance companies are balking at it, and I, I don't blame them. Uh, uh, the bang for your buck, there's a lot of buck and not much bang there. But uh, if the buck was spent on devices instead of the questionable pharma, uh, we would end up having hundreds of people uh, with, with these devices. And at that point, we start to have a large enough end to start to make some statements it's kind of a shame uh, pharma ends up having uh, the resource to do the studies that they're doing. The price of the medication they come up with is enough for a handful of people uh, to treat an entire community of people. You know, it's kind of borderline foolish to see them approving that and not investing uh, in the studies, a large study with something as promising as photobiomodulation. Actually, there's a lot of controversies. It, FDA gave Biogen, Biogen is a joint effort between Biogen and ASI on Adulham, the drug. They were, FDA gave them emergency use authorization, which means that they have to go do a bigger trial to, to validate you know, the initial findings. But it's gonna cost, they wanted to charge the, each patient $56,000 a year and it's not like you pop a pill, you actually have to go and do an in, in, intravenous uh, injection to get a fluid into your body. The problem was the evidence was scanned. They picked up evidence, almost like cherry picking from a certain part of the, you know, all this data and say, you know, it's so much, not so much a clinical outcomes, but they saw a reduction in beta amyloid markers. So that kind of equate to, well, they were, this is like, you know, uh, what a lot of researchers in, in Alzheimer's disease were aiming for. So they got that, but the side effect was brain swelling. Actually, uh, beginning of this year, it was reported that a woman died because of this particular thing. So first of all, the, the medical community refused, generally refused to prescribe this because of the side effects known. You know, uh, because of that, it's, they try to halve the cause and pretty much put an end to this, this whole thing. But I gotta say uh, something that you know Jay also brought up in about mitochondrial, you know, in fact, now photobiomodulation, it's pretty well established, excellent mitochondrial, give you more energy and produce all these transcription factors uh, that translate into good outcomes. Uh, but for a long time, Alzheimer's disease has been based on the amyloid a cascade hypothesis. So you concentrate on amyloid, you're going to solve it. But, uh, you know, Alzheimer's is caused by so many different possible pathologies in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So you can't just treat one thing and expect, you know, uh, a cure for it. So now there is, I don't know, Jay, you heard the big controversy in Alzheimer's disease research is this whole thing about the amyloid theory when uh, now they have now they've uh, re retracted the original study that came out of Minnesota uh, that attributed Alzheimer's disease to to beta amyloid. The data was flawed, so now this whole this basic theory is is in disarray, and it's gone back to square one. Billions have been invested into you know research based on this particular theory. I'm a great believer in. Now the uh, mitochondrial leads to different, different what they call different path to, you know, in, in, in a pathology. So because it deals with the fundamental, the fundamental mechanisms in the cells, which is everywhere. So maybe that's it's, uh, that is one way to go. One intervention with multiple outcomes, multiple pathways. So I thought that is a good way to good way to argue it. The mitochondrial hypothesis is kind of making a comeback and the, the amyloid cascade is going to retract, you know, fall back a bit. It's promising for photobiomodulation. That's all I can say right now. <laughs> Dr. Lim, if you do a Google search for photo 
modulation, what what symptoms will come up to the top that it, it can serve or has a higher likelihood of helping with symptoms? You, you probably did a Google and many things came up. You're looking for the brain. Okay, that's the neurological outcomes. Uh, you see a lot of pain. You, use, you know, pain is pretty good. There's a lot of use in, in veterinary. There is, you know, in dentistry particularly, uh, uh, I think it's it actually has a strong hold in the dentistry profession because it just helps with quicker healing. And uh, today they're talking about the post-cancer effects of mucositis, addressing it. I think FDA uh, insurance company is looking to uh, approving it for that. And there's a bunch in the aesthetic field, screen, skin rejuvenation, hair growth, you know, this is everywhere. Actually, I, I do believe it does help. With, and that doesn't need FDA approval because it's aesthetic, it's not quite in the medical field. So I guess in the field of photobiomodulation equipment, I say the biggest portion of it is in, is in aesthetics. You know, there's also fat reduction, a bunch of things. How is the military you know, using it? Military, actually military is very careful. They do a lot of research because, before they take on anything. And if you're talking about and performance enhancement, they are more familiar with electrical stimulation, magnetic stimulation. Uh, they are, I know they've they contacted me and they were looking at the photobiomodulation as well. But it is a slow process. In the military, well, let's talk about related to military, the VA field. We're making inroads more on that particular part in helping with uh, PTSD, in helping with uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, we've been used in guard war illness. And those actually, they all have positive results. We are actually still in discussion with them about how to use it to help with uh, PTSD. But I say it's a very slow process. They look at many alternatives, They're super careful. And the, the feel is actually you know, pretty big, I would say. But PTSD is one area we has been used before. I think the outcome has been good. We have talked about a clinical trial, but you know, there's so many things that we're doing, it's just slow to take off in that particular area. So peak performance, alpha, theta, that you could use in conjunction, a holistic approach. Guys, what do you think? I would like to understand the precision aspect of it to be more precise. So I think that this work we're doing now will give us a good foundation to go to, you know, say the military and say you do certain specific things for different people. I think that's where the quick Pondering technology we can use is with EEG, neurofeedback, because done well, you know, done faster than fMRI and it's convenient. Um, we can see virtually immediate response from the brain. And we are actually seriously looking to this. We are, like I mentioned before, we're about to start a study of meditation using EEG and see uh, how we can personalize it to different brains. I say that long-term meditators, they get into, they switch into this altered state, a temporary state of bliss or you know, enlightenment uh, when they hit a certain frequency, when they meditation. It is uh, super interesting to me. And I have, I have a hypothetical explanation on how this is happening, but I want to see um, you know, a clinical study being done. It is to do with, inhibiting the default mode network, my opinion, with frequencies. And the networks are an interesting phenomenon. The default mode network is uh, seen in an fMRI as a resting state, the brain doing nothing. But in fact, the network is actually four segments that rapidly flip-flop between the segments. When you look at microstate analysis of the default mode network, you find that the posterior cingulate to the left temporoparietal junction is one segment, and that's a bidirectional segment. Posterior cingulate to the right, again, bidirectional. Posterior cingulate to the anterior, and that's a unidirectional going forward only. And then the posterior cingulate all by itself. The reason that you see the four spots light up with a big bright one at the 
kind of the PZ posterior cingulate location is that that hub is actually present all four times. The others are only there one out of four times. So you end up seeing the big bright dot uh, because it's there more in a more stable way. The others come and go. And I, I would suggest the brain isn't actually at rest. It's twiddling its thumbs. You know, it's, there's still some action going on. It's resting, but ready. It's not actually at rest. Uh, the, there, there are people that try to model uh, the network as though it's a stable network because in fMRI, it's a stable network. But in EEG land, hubs shift about every 82 to 84 milliseconds to another segment of that hub. So in a 10 second image, which is about what you get for an fMRI, you, you, you've got hundreds of, of shifts that have been going on. So it's a, it's a rapid cycling uh, that, that appears to be at rest in an fMRI. So I, I think that uh, the EEG is going to end up providing dynamics that, that the fMRI just can't produce. And it's not just alpha in the default mode network, Roberto Pascal Marquis's study on microstate analysis shows there's actually beta in, the, in that network as well. But the, the default mode network is at rest basically, but when something becomes salient, the anterior cingulate and insulae end up being the salience network. If the mm -hmm. anterior cingulate mm -hmm. signal goes back to the posterior hub in the default mode network, it shuts down that network the salience network really can just turn off the default mode. And at that point, the executive network turns on to figure out what it was that was salient and whether you can go back at rest or you need to stay active and focused. So uh, those three networks flip-flop between the networks really quite frequently. And the dynamics of that is actually seen in the low frequencies. Uh, so the, the fMRI is going to show some of the dynamics basically as uh, very slow metabolic shifts. The fMRI shows glial function more than neural function. Yeah, Jade is very interesting. You, you might be interested to know that we actually did microstate analysis and we did a more traditional way. We looked at the, the microstate analysis, you about 70% fall into four classes, A, B, C, D. So we did a gamma, the, the way we do it, uh, we found that there was significant changes in the class A uh, microstate. This is a more traditional way. We have a time to publish it. We've got so, many, so much data. So we hope we can get down and sit down and write this paper because uh, it has quite a lot of implications. And this is one, we just did it one way and we found actually it does we see significant mod, you know, influence on the microstates and, and we can and then, you know, it correlates certain classes, the major classes to a different state. We can actually influence it. And I I believe microstate is a way that uh, is just being starting to be explored, but I think it's the future where things can go in terms of personalization. Yeah. So so watch out for it. Maybe you get time to write a paper out. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> Last thing to touch on, Dr. Lim, and then we'll we'll let you go. And I don't know if you can do it quickly or not, but for ADHD, I know more studies need to be done, but there's a lot of parents out there that have a have kids with ADHD or think they do. They use neurofeedback to help. But how, how does photomodulation uh, help out with kids with ADHD? I believe because photobiomodulation can modify brainwave forms. Uh, it may help. And we actually get pretty good reports from people with ADHD and even autism. Uh, pretty quick and quite remarkable. They, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, a lot of ADHD you see very high power in the slow waves, like the delta theta, maybe hyper coherence, coherence there, and low power in the faster frequency, like you know, beta and gamma. Uh, when we deliver the gamma in the brain, we actually see it modifying and reducing the the slow waveforms, the, the amplitude of the slow waveform increasing the the uh, faster waveforms. Mm -hmm. So that, but I also got to tell you, you know, very often we we touch ADHD and autism, well, autism first, you know, and ADHD is kind of uh, related. Uh, there was a study done independently using inducing alpha and gamma. And once 
Therefore, say in the morning, in camera, in the evening, by a group of Italian scientists. Completely independent from us. They got our devices. We had no idea what they were doing. Uh, <laughs> then they published this paper and showed that the outcomes for autism was was actually very significant. They have very good p-values and they're all measured. You know, they have the usual autism scale and also what the effects are on a family, you know, the quality of life. Uh, if people are interested, you know, I can, I can forward the paper to you. I can distribute it or whatever. I love it, love that. So you. that, uh, yeah, that is, uh, I, you know, I thought it was very significant. Um, so in ADD, a lot of people don't, really focus on the gamma aspect of it, but I'd like to show something here. What we basically see here is a normal person, high functioning ADD and low functioning ADD as measured with a CPT task. And this is the GO stimulus that the people have perceived. Uh, the, the intention of this slide was to show uh, the synchronization in beta, but I'd like to point to the gamma frequencies. This goes from uh, DC to 74 hertz. So in the 35, 40 hertz range on up, you can see these big sheets of gamma happening. One, two, three, four, five, number six happens right on the end here. That's gamma nested in theta uh, frontally. Again, gamma. Now here's a high functioning ADD. One, two, three, four, five, six, but they're weak. And here's the low functioning ADD, and they're missing some of the nested gamma. So if photobiomodulation can enhance gamma, uh, the, the clinical group uh, that's normal here have the gamma. The ones that are clinically more severe have less and less gamma. So uh, there, there's theoretically uh, a good application for photobiomodulation to enhance the presence of gamma frequencies in the brains of ADD ADHD kids because it's been shown that they have a deficit. And, you know, most of the neurofeedback is focusing on alpha or theta or beta, uh, but very, very little is actually focusing on the gamma aspect of uh, ADD, uh, but it's, it's a major piece of what's not working right in these people. So there's, there's a solid theoretical basis for inducing more gamma being clinically relevant for ADD and ADHD. Dr. Lim, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure. It's been fun. I enjoyed it. Doc, Dr. Lim, the viewers, they want to learn more about you. Where should we point them to? Well, go to the V-Light website, V-I-E-L-I-G-H-T dot com. The biggest thing that we're involved right now that's immediate is on COVID-19. Uh, we got really good evidence on, you know, treating uh, COVID-19, particularly the severe symptoms. We are waiting for regulatory approval and before we even want to publish the data. But I say we also are looking into the long COVID, particularly brain fog. So we're actually designing the study right now and going to it. So maybe through your channel, we can get some volunteers. <laughs> Those who are actually suffering from yeah, long COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Lim, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you all for watching Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology Podcast. We'd like to thank our Patreon business supporters. We are supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience Incorporated, the creators of NeuroGuide, the premier EEG assessment and training software whose demo version can be downloaded from the link here. Hey, check it out. Applied Neuroscience is having a workshop September 10th and 11th in Florida, Madura Beach, Florida. Hey, two ways you can participate. You can attend the workshop or you can do it remotely through TeamViewer or click on the link here, appliedneuroscience.com slash attend ng-workshops. Hey, check it out. Dr. Thatcher is inviting everybody that attends to his house for a cookout. Sign up now. It's going to be a blast. Woohoo! If you have any questions, email QEEG at AppliedNeuroscience.com. Join us. 
Hey, thanks to our silver supporters, Mary Tracy's awesome QEG training program at EEGstrategies.com and Mind Media's Nexus EEG Amplifier. Welcome aboard, Erwin. They're at mindmedia.com. Three things our listeners can do to help us spread the word of neurofeedback. Number one, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Number two, give us a review on whatever platform you listen to. Five stars is appreciated, but Jay Gunkelman will accept four and a half. Hey, if you have the means, please support us on Patreon slash NeuroNoodle. There are different levels in which you can support us, whether you're a mom or dad or a clinician. There's even an option where you can have your own Q&A with our own Jay Gunkelman. This support help, helps us improve the quality of our content. Hey, trying to get these video edits even better, even better. Again, we thank you all for watching. Cue the non-copyrighted music.